Center, Understanding Prostate Cancer in the Age of Personalized Medicine, hosted and brought to you today by Zero, the end of prostate cancer. I'm Ivy Ahmed, Director of Patient Education, Zero, the end of prostate cancer. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our call is being recorded, and it will be archived on our website at a later date so that you can go back and access it. The format of today's program will be as follows. Our presenter, Dr. Michael Brower, will be featured first and go through our slides, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. For those of you who are participating over the computer, you'll see a box uh, in the control panel that says questions, and so please use that to submit questions uh, at any point during the event so that Dr. Brower can answer them at the end of the presentation. We do have an hour for the presentation, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. And again, for those of you who are online, once you close out of the webinar, you will be redirected to a post-event survey. So I would just ask that you take a few minutes to complete the survey because your, value, your input is extremely valuable to us as we create new programs and bring pieces to um, people affected by prostate cancer. And it's only eight questions, so please feel free to take that for us. All right, so let's get started. Well, great. Thanks, Ivy. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Brower. I'm a urologist, spent my career in prostate cancer, both in academic and in the private sector, and now work for uh, Proveria Genetics. Um, so let me just start this at the get-go. First of all, I, because I work for Myriad, and we're going to talk about a test Myriad uh, uh, developed and sells the Prolaris test, that would be my statement of my potential conflicts of interest. But I've been a student of this disease, prostate cancer, for more than 30 years and have been a researcher, an educator, and a treater of patients. So I think I have some perspectives on this. And let me let me just give an editorial comment at the start, and that is I think most of you on this phone either have prostate cancer or have a loved one that has prostate cancer and want to learn more about it. And I think you, if you have this disease, now is as good a time in history as we ever have because lots of advances are, are being made across the whole spectrum from diagnosis to predicting uh, uh, how patients are going to do with their cancer, or what we call prognosis, to advances in treatment. So I, I say that to that in the hopes that you'll keep an open heart and realize there's lots to be done and lots of options at all stages of prostate cancer today. So this just gives a little background about me. We can go on to the next slide. I think Ivy, you want to? You've mentioned some of this, but it's important to uh, really specific questions. You need you, the audience, needs to address with their with your clinician, uh, but I'll be glad to answer any questions I can uh, at the conclusion of the formal remarks. So we're going to talk about prostate, where we are uh, with prostate cancer today, some of the issues surrounding prostate cancer, go over briefly some of the treatment options. I suspect that many of you have already, uh, have already received at least initial treatment. Uh, and then we'll go on and uh, open it up at the end for, for your questions and comments. Next, please. So you all know the prostate exists only in men, and it's in the uh, deep in the, in the male pelvis, which renders it problematic for a lot of our treatment modalities. It's at the base of the urinary bladder, just in, flood, in front of the rectum. And through the center of the prostate, the urethra, the tube from the bladder to the penis goes, and that's uh, the, the channel that we urinate through. And that gives rise to some of the symptoms that can occur with prostate cancer, but more commonly associated with benign enlargement of the prostate, where there's non-cancerous growth in the prostate that can give rise to voiding difficulty. The uh, purpose of the prostate really is fundamentally to provide an enzyme, PSA, which allows the ejaculate or the semen to 
change its physical characteristics such that it now can uh, swim up the female uh, reproductive tract and cause the pregnancy. It also has some role in uh, decreasing the chance of urinary tract infections. But in general, it can be stated except for when you want to uh, have a baby, you don't uh, you don't need a prostate unless meant you know without a prostate, either surgically or radiation, et cetera, can do just fine. Next slide. So prostate cancer is a big problem in the United States and in most westernized nations throughout the world. This year, the American Cancer Society uh, predicts we'll diagnose this disease in <clears throat> almost a quarter of a million men, and just under 30,000 men will die of prostate cancer. <clears throat> Excuse me, the lifetime risk of the diagnosis of prostate cancer today is about one in seven men. But note from the line above, clinically relevant prostate cancer, cancer that can be life and threatening, is actually much less likely, as evidenced by the quarter million diagnoses and only 30,000 deaths. Uh, we, currently, we estimate that 2.8 million men in the United States are living with this disease. The African American population is unique in that they have the highest risk of prostate cancer in the world. The, the big one of the big advances in prostate cancer has been the ability primarily with PSA to lead to, which leads to earlier diagnosis. And that's what we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years, a decreasing rate of death or chance of dying of prostate cancer. Perhaps in large part, but not certainly uh, exclusively owing to earlier diagnosis and more definitive therapy. Um, it's really important, and we're going to emphasize this, that not all prostate cancers are the same. One man's prostate cancer may well, even with aggressive treatment, lead to his death, whereas the vast majority of prostate cancers probably can be managed uh, conservatively without aggressive therapy, uh, and the patients will do just fine. And that really is the cornerstone of what we're going to talk about today. And what the Myriad test, Polaris, does, it, it allows us to predict the risk of a man's prostate cancer as to whether it's going to affect the quality or quantity of his life uh, much more precisely than standard tests such as PSA, Gleason, and clinical stage. Next slide. So what are the current issues in prostate cancer? And obviously there are many. Next, please. And one of the great issues is this, what I've already alluded to, the, the huge discrepancy between the quarter million roughly patients that will have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and that came from about 1.2 million men in the United States who will, who will be biopsied for prostate cancer this year. But of those quarter million men, only 30,000 will actually die from prostate cancer. So there's a huge discrepancy between the diagnosis of prostate cancer and cancer that might uh, that like that has a, a likelihood that it will actually kill the patient. That makes prostate cancer really unique amongst the common malignancies that we that we suffer, lung cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, all of those have a much higher chance of dying from the cancer than than we have in prostate cancer relative to the number of diagnoses. So there, therein lies a huge discrepancy in that we need to better predict which cancers are able to cause significant uh, uh, possibility of leading to the patient's death, whereas which, as opposed to which cancers are have low virulence or, or non-aggressive cancers that likely will do, uh, the patient will do fine with even no treatment. Next slide. So the way I look at it is we really have two fundamental problems. On the one hand, there's no question that many men are being diagnosed in treatment and, and treated 
with cancer of very low aggressiveness. And that has led to what probably many of you are aware of, and a, a suspicion that we're over-treating prostate cancer in a high percentage of patients. But we also have another problem, and that is we have 30,000 men that will die this year. And in those men, our treatment has been not over-treatment, it's been woefully inadequate, it's under-treatment. And so what we need is, is more accurate tests or, or, or better assessment of the what I term malignant potential or the aggressiveness of a man's cancer, such that it will, with this additional test, more likely predict which cancers can be left untreated or active surveillance or watchful waiting and not subjecting the patient immediately to aggressive therapy. But moreover, which cancers are undertreated, that is when we use one form of therapy, say radiation or radical prostatectomy, we still have a high likelihood of failure and those patients would be better served with more aggressive, more intense therapy. Next please. So all this comes down to the concept of risk stratification. That is, we know that Mr. Jones' cancer and Mr. Smith's cancer may look the same under the microscope, and his PSA may be the same, and they may feel the same on the digital rectal examination, but they can be dramatically different on the biologic uh, potential of that cancer, the, the, the intrinsic cellular and molecular changes that make that cancer in Mr. Jones, say, likely to never cause any problems, but the cancer in Mr. Smith that looks similar actually can be much, much more aggressive. And these tests need to add to the existing tests, the tests we use all the time, which include PSA, the tumor stage, the Gleason score, but we need to go beyond that. And these better tests generally are molecular or genetic-based tests that more precisely identify the changes from the DNA and the RNA that give rise to the actual change in the cancer cell that may make it more or less aggressive. Next slide. So the prostate biopsy, most of you I think have had a diagnosis and the vast majority would have had a prostate biopsy for the, for the diagnosis. What we do is we take a very small needle, generally under ultrasound guidance, and we slip it into the prostate, most commonly through the patient's rectum, and it allows us in the patient that is at risk for prostate cancer, either because the doctor felt an abnormality or because there was an elevation of the PSA, or rarely because of some symptoms, we can take a very small sliver of the prostate out, and generally we take 10 or 12 or 14 slivers out at a time and then look at them under the microscope. And that tells us two things. One, is there a cancer present? And two, what does the cancer look like? We assign a grade to it, which is a way of looking at the range of that man's cancer as a departure from normal looking prostate through low risk cancer, intermediate risk, and then the most aggressive cancer. And the most common grading system that we use in the United States, and really the rest of the world now, is the Gleason grading system. Next slide. So there are a number of tests now to enhance our prediction of the aggressiveness of the cancer as compared to what we get from our standard parameters, both the Gleason score that we get by looking at the cancer, but also the PSA and the stage of the cancer, which is generally uh, identified based on the digital rectal examination. So the three tests that are available today to do that on the prostate biopsy would, the, would be the Polaris test uh, for Myriad, the, the company I work for, the Oncotype uh, DX test, which is by uh, Genomic Health, and also Prostavision, which is a test that's uh, widely uh, available through Bosworth Laboratories. And these tests are all different as this slide shows. They require uh, different amounts of tumor. Uh, they all are done on the prostate needle biopsy. 
they differ primarily in, I think, two fundamental uh, aspects. Number one, what is the outcome which we get from the test? Now, if you look at the fourth row there, the outcome predicted, the uh, Polaris test, all the, we, we've done many, many studies, which I'll come back to in a second. But in all of our studies, we look at what I term real oncologic endpoints, actual things that the cancer does to you with prostate cancer. That is, it, it causes your death or what we call disease-specific mortality. It, the patients die from prostate cancer. It causes metastasis, or our test predicts metastasis, the chance that the cancer is going to spread throughout the body. And also it predicts biochemical recurrence, or BCR, which is the first endpoint after treatment, either by radiation or radical prostatectomy, as a sign that the cancer has not been cured. The, so that's what our test does. The test by uh, Genomic Health, the Oncotype, really looks at the prediction of pathology if you were to have a radical prostatectomy based on the extent of your disease and the, the Gleason's grade or, or how aggressive the cancer looks at the microscope. And the big departure difference between these is the genomic test is predicting a, a surrogate or a, a predict, it's a, it predicts a prediction of outcome. It doesn't actually predict the cancer outcome. Our test, Polaris, predicts the actual cancer outcome. And then the prostate division test, which is not very widely used anymore because it's, it's fallen into disfavor because the studies really haven't shown it's very helpful, is kind of in between. It kind of, they do have some data that suggests it can predict uh, biochemical recurrence, but it's really a major uh, predictor of sort of these intermediate endpoints. The other point that I'd like to make on this slide that I think is important is really how the studies were done. And this is a, a detail that is a little bit complicated, but I, I, I want, I'm going to try and make this clear to you. What we did at, at Myriad is we, 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 we set our genetic signature. In other words, we picked the gene, genes that we were going to measure, and we picked how we were going to analyze these genes before we ever looked at patient groups or studies where we knew the outcome of the patient. The other studies have optimized the test when they already knew the patient outcome. And this is a subtle difference, but in a nutshell, what it means is the other tests that are on this slide actually tailored the test for the, the group that they were going to study with the outcome. We didn't do that. We, we were blinded to the outcome when we developed the test. And what that has allowed now in, we've now done, uh, we published a, or we've submitted our ninth validation study of totally different patients from, that were diagnosed as much as 30 years ago up to recently diagnosed with multi, multi forms of therapy, including watchful waiting or conservative management patients treated with radiation, patients treated with ground prostatectomy. And our test works about the same across all these different patient groups and different treatments. And it's all because we didn't tailor our test to be designed for one specific group. The other two have done that. The other major departure, I think, between the other uh, tests that are available based on biopsy is ours is we now, as I said, have uh, eight studies published and the nine submitted, all showing the test works. And the other, the other groups really are, are, are very far behind that. And as you know, in everything in medicine, the more you publish in the good journals, the more reputable your test is. So I think those are the two primary differences between us and the, the other tests. Next slide, please. The prostate vision test uh, measures a, a what's called a gene fusion where, where two genes are, are, 
are occur on different uh, chromosomes than we than are normal, and also the loss of a of a what what's called a tumor suppressor gene, which is a gene that that uh, inhibits tumor growth. It combines these two in this test, and as I said, it's available from uh, Bosworth Laboratories. But in general, it's fallen into uh, disfavor largely because the P10 abnormality that it looks for is a rare event in clinical in, in current diagnosis of prostate cancer. It really occurs primarily in advanced disease, and that's it doesn't really help us in making the early treatment decision. Next slide, please. The Oncotype DX test looks at a number of different genes from uh, five different categories. Some of the genes are, are increased in bad cancer and some of the genes are increased in good cancer or less aggressive cancer. But it's a 17 gene uh, assay looking at different uh, classifications of genes uh, and gives a output, as I said, or the result you get is based on uh, your the likelihood that you have more aggressive cancer either by stage or by Gleason grade of four or higher. Um, next slide. And the data that you get from the uh, Oncotype DX test is shown on this slide, and what it what it does it's a confusing slide, but uh, basically it's it's the indication is in either very low to uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer based on the NCCN guidelines, and it where you are on this curve on the left the the uh, GPS or the uh, genomic prostate score is used to uh, add to the information that we get from the NCCN categorization, which is basically using Gleason score, PSA, and clinical stage. Next slide. So the Polaris test is different. The test from Myriad is different in that all, we, we use 31 genes as opposed to their 17 genes. And then we have what we call housekeeper genes, which allow us to, to compare the expression of these genes to, uh, between patients looking at genes that don't change in cancer. But all of the Polaris genes are what we call cell cycle progression genes. These are the, set, the genes that tell a cancer cell to divide. So one cancer cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, Et cetera, et cetera. Now, this unregulated cell division is the absolute hallmark of prostate cancer and indeed all cancer. In fact, if you ask a fourth grader what is cancer, they'll likely tell you it's, it's an abnormality where cells divide with no regulation. And that's what these genes do. That's what the Polaris genes, the cell cycle progression genes do. They tell a cell to divide. And when Polaris was being developed in Myriad. Myriad is the company that uh, developed or discovered the, the test for hereditary breast and ovarian uh, cancer. And the, the test that Angeline Jolene uh, had, which led to her treatment because of her risk of, of breast cancer. It's a very widely used test. But at the time of the development of Polaris, there was a lot of expertise in Myriad in in breast cancer, and there was no expertise in prostate cancer. But the, the scientists at Myriad knew a lot about breast cancer. They knew that in all of these risk uh, tests or pr predict, uh, prognostic tests in breast cancer, it was these genes, these cell cycle progression genes, that provided the most information in breast cancer. And that's why the scientists decided to utilize the cell cycle progression genes in prostate cancer to do our development work. And again, they picked these genes without looking at any outcome or known outcome in prostate cancer, and that's why they, all the studies work. They all worked about as well, despite very, very differences 
great differences in the patient population, treatments, etc. And it really is, is I think, testimony to the, the huge degree of importance of these genes in differentiating cancers that are more aggressive, that have a, a higher copy of these genes, as opposed to cancers that are less aggressive. And this has been now shown in multiple studies to provide much more predict, much more accurate prediction of the likelihood of a cancer, of a man's cancer killing him, developing metastasis, or leading to failure of therapy. The next slide, please. So in all, many, many studies, and I'm just showing here uh, on a couple of studies in, in patients that are conservatively managed, they were, they were diagnosed with prostate cancer, they were then followed, uh, and were not given any curative therapy, so they were what we would call watchful waiting in the United States. And it's a small slide, it's hard, hard to see, but what these curves, what these, these dots, either the blue, which is uh, Gleason grade six or less, the green is Gleason seven, and the, uh, the red is Gleason eight to 10. If you look at these, if you look at the risk, and this is the risk of dying, and you look at the, the vertical axis, the, the y-axis on the left, the one that's going vertically, thank you. You can see that if you're blue, low risk, in, the, in these conservatively managed cases, you had about an 8% chance of dying. If you were intermediate risk it, with a Gleason 7, you had about a 25-26% a, a chance of dying. And overall, you had a 60% if you were at high risk. But on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, the one that's labeled CCP score and Gleason risk, we've now added Prolaris to the Gleason score. And that expansion in a horizontal direction are all individual patients. And you can see, if you look, for example, the intermediate risk, or the green, without Prolaris, you would have said they all, have, all the patients look the same, and you have about a 25% chance of dying. But if you add Prolaris, the risk on the x-axis goes from about 3% all the way up to 80%. So you can see that the Gleason 7s range from, as I said, about 6% to 80%. Whereas if you, when you add Prolaris, but if you don't use Prolaris, you'd say all, all, they all look the same and they've got about a 25% chance of dying in prostate. So Polaris is independent. It provides new information compared to what your clinician uh, is using when they make a prognos prognostic prediction based on either uh, Gleason, PSA, T clinical stage, et cetera. And it's much more precise when we add Polaris. It gives you the ri your actual risk, not your risk with people that may look that based on those parameters are the same, but actually have much more aggressive or less aggressive disease. Uh, it's a very powerful predictor. In all of our studies, it's either the best or uh, co-equal with another one of these parameters in predicting uh, either failure of therapy or, or death of, from disease. Next slide. So, there are also tests, if you've had a prostatectomy, where you can do these gene-based tests to, to provide more informative prognostic information based on the radical prostatectomy specimen. And there are two companies that have tests. We have our, 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 our post-radical prostatectomy test, and another test known as Decipher is also available. Both these tests are done on the radical prostatectomy specimen. Uh, they, they both offer, uh, as the outcome predicted, what I would term real oncologic endpoints. Um, we provide perhaps a little bit more because we, we can uh, more closely predict mortality. But I think both these tests uh, are useful in the post-radical prostatectomy setting. Ours uses the same genes we, we discussed a moment ago in the biopsy test, the decipher test uses a different set of genes. But in general, 
uh, I think both tests uh, offer information. The, the, the real question is, does it add, do they add a lot of information as opposed to what you get without it? And part of that answer comes from the fact it's really unclear at this point as to the optimum therapy of patients who have had a radical prostatectomy. Should you add additional therapy based on your existing information, that is what the cancer looks like under the microscope, the stage, et cetera, should you add one of these other tests, which will give you a more accurate prediction of what how you're going to do, but there's no definitive answer as to the, the, the best treatment in these settings. So I think in patients that want more information as to what, whether they should go on to additional or adjuvant therapy after radical testing, these tests are useful, but we need to remember there's no definitive proof that an earlier addition of, say, radiation, as opposed to waiting to when you, when you have biochemical failure, that is, your PSA goes up, actually makes a difference. Next slide. So the decipher test, again, is this is more detailed than, than probably you want to do. It's a multi-gene test. It's been studied quite well at the Mayo Clinic and other places. There's a number of uh, genes that they that they look at, and the the definitive answer is a prediction of uh, both biochemical recurrence, but also they can predict who is going to develop metastasis with that test. Next, please. Uh, this is just looking at how the the results are, are shown, and it's a complicated slide, but it does show that you can get some separation. Those sort of hourglass things show that as the Gleason score went up on the x-axis, there was an increase in the uh, in the decipher test score. So it correlated with the Gleason, but it does provide some information that's useful. My personal problem with this test is, as you see here, there's a lot of overlap when you look at the different grades, and that can be confusing uh, depending on where you fall in that in that categorization. Next slide. So the Polaris test, uh, and these are two radical prostatectomy series. If you look at the the one on the right, that's uh, a more recent, more contemporary. So it kind of is probably what you should focus on. And here I've done, I've shown you similar to what I did on the uh, biopsy slide that also showed that scatter plot. So on the on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we're looking at different Gleason scores again, as you see in the box. So blue is Gleason uh, uh, less six or less. Orange is Gleason 3-4, green is 4-3, and then the the one on top, which I can't exactly tell what color that is, purplish, uh, is Gleason 8s, 9s, and 10s. And so this is looking at chance of failure of radical prostatectomy. This this series came from UC San Francisco. Peter Carroll and Matt Cooperberg uh, are the authors, primary authors of this study. And what you see is Say let's let's look at say you're at a, a three four, so you're orange. Overall in the UC San Francisco series, if you just look at Gleason, you would predict that you have about a twenty eight percent chance of failing radical prostatectomy if you're a Gleason three four. But if you add Prolaris again, as we did on the the uh, x axis, the range is from about eight percent to about 75 percent. So you can see by adding Prolaris, you dramatically have about a threefold increase in range of risk of failure that you would not under, you would not know if you just used Gleason or if you you could do this with any uh, assessment. You could do it with the AUA risk categorization, the NCCN risk categorization. You can you know add PSA, whatever you want to do. We, every time we've looked at this, you see a tremendous expansion of the risk 
and more importantly, a much more precise prediction of the risk for the individual patient's cancer. Next slide. So when you all are making your treatment decisions, whether it's for the initial uh, therapy or if you've got prostate cancer and you're considering additional therapy, we always look at some standard parameters, stage, Gleason score, PSA, etc. But these tests that we've gone over so far this morning or this afternoon for many of you have, are, are tests that can much more accurately predict your risk as to the risk of patients that on the surface look like your cancer but actually don't. It allows much more personalized uh, medicine when we have more individualized risks. Next, next slide. So we can turn quickly to uh, the issue of process, uh, treatment of prostate cancer. I'm going to go try and go a little bit fast so we do have 20 minutes or so for discussion. Obviously, there's a lot of you that are probably undergoing active surveillance where basically we monitor you largely with PSA, DRE, and uh, repeat biopsy for progression of prostate cancer because initially your clinician thought your cancer was one that we could follow and not treat aggressively initially. And here in these individual, these different tests, particularly Prolaris, are very useful in making sure that the doctor is making the right decision in this regard. Uh, next slide. The next most common form of therapy or second most common after, after surveillance is a radical prostatectomy. And radical prostatectomy uh, is the surgical removal of the entire prostate and surrounding tissues. It can be done by a variety of methods and we've made great progress I think in decreasing the morbidity of radical prostatectomy. But as many of you undoubtedly are aware, there is a big, still a, a high rate of both urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction following this surgical procedure. Next slide. And the other most common modality of therapy, at least in the United States, is radiation, which can be given in a number of ways, either external radiation, where the radiation source is outside of the body, or actually uh, by putting radiation directly into the prostate with a treatment called brachytherapy. And these all, all of these approaches, uh, in my opinion, radiation and surgery offer uh, effectively in properly selected patients about the same rate of cure. Both of them have considerable side effects associated with it, primarily uh, uh, urinary problems, uh, uh, erectile dysfunction in both radiation and surgery, and uh, injury to the rectum. Uh, primarily in the radiation treated patients. Next slide. And finally we turn to hormone therapy as one of the other most commonly performed treatments and this hormone therapy is the approach usually by injections where we lower the male hormone testosterone. Testosterone acts as fertilizer to prostate cancer. It allows it to grow much more rapidly and become much more aggressive. But with, in rare, with rare exception, removal of the hormone therapy, androgen to deprivation, is not curative. It's more commonly used to treat advanced disease, oftentimes in combination with other therapy, but it, it is not, it is rarely on its own curative. Next slide. And finally, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, these are used in the advanced prostate cancer setting where the cancer has spread beyond the prostate or patients that have failed initial curative therapy. And when we've made strides in chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and more advanced uh, forms of androgen deprivation, at best these lead to, on average, a few months increase in survival. And, Rarely are these approaches curative, but they can be. And so it's something that, that one should consider as you fall into the more advanced stages of prostate cancer. Next slide. I think this one is just immunotherapy. And immunotherapy is just a way of, of turning on your own immune system to fight the prostate cancer. 
Next, please. The side effects of prostate cancer, we, we've hit on these. You know what they are. First of all, not everyone's going to have side effects, and the degree of the side effects varies tremendously based on your overall health, the, the, uh, the characteristics of your cancer, what form of therapy you use, and the skill of your treating physician. But you need to be aware that side effects can be uh, can occur in, in, in a not insignificant number of patients. Uh, it's also important to know if you have side effects, uh, many of these can be ameliorated or, or the burden of these side effects lessened with additional therapy. Next slide. Uh, I think in the interest of time so we can answer the questions, I'm going to skip these detailed slides on the side effects. I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have on that. Uh, next. Uh, same with sexual therapy. And I think really here is the important thing. You need to stay informed. And Zero is a great organization with lots of educational materials. If you're undoubtedly aware, there are other things you can do. These are questions that you may want to jot down and, and think about when you're discussing your cancer treatment with your uh, physicians. They're all important issues. Uh, and and really, I mean, the important thing to remember is the most well, the better informed you are about the disease, about the nuances of your uh, specific therapy, the better treatment decisions you're going to be, be able to make. Uh, I think we'll skip that and go on to the next. This is, you know, where you can get a lot of this information. I'm sure these, this, these slides will all be archived on the Zero website, and you can go back and look at that list again. But now, if if we can, uh, let's open it up to discussion. Uh, Ivy, if you can uh, organize the questions, I'd be glad to answer what I can. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Bauer. That was an amazing presentation. And thank you for submitting questions. So we've had people submitting questions throughout the presentation, and we're going to start off with um, a question from Martin, who's actually having a biopsy tomorrow. He had a PCA3 test, a urine test, and his score was 27. His PSO has been relatively low. He's gone from a 2.6 to a 2.88. He's 50 years old, and he's um, really trying to kind of figure out what to do next. Okay, and you're scheduled for biopsy tomorrow. I think, you know, that's a reasonable thing. Well, whereas that PSA would be considered low uh, overall in a 50-year-old, it's it's uh, it's at the range where you might be worried. I don't know if your physician felt anything when he did his, the rectal examination. And I think you said the PCA3 was 47? 27. Oh, 27? Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's relatively low, but... Again, the change in your PSA and you know your clinician's uh, 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 concern enough that a biopsy should be done. It's a relatively simple, relatively painless procedure. Rarely has significant side effects, and I think you know at your age, as long as you know that the the uh, you know the the pros and cons. You've got a long life expectancy ahead of you, so uh, an early diagnosis of prostate cancer in a 50-year-old is probably warranted, and I think you've made the right decision. Great, and so our next question is from Ed, and he wants to know a little bit more about the M new MRI procedure um, for the diagnostic procedure which is clearly less invasive, and do you have any more information about sort of that di new diagnostic? Sure. Procedure? So MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging, has been around for a long time. In the last four or five years, we've done, we made a lot of advances uh, in how we do the imaging, uh, what we call multi-parametric. We, we, we manipulate the image in a number of ways which has made it more useful than it was before in finding cancer in the prostate, perhaps a little bit better in uh, 
in assessing the stage of the prostate cancer or how what what the chances is it's gone beyond the confines of the prostate. It's had a lot of interest uh, primarily in Europe, but now there's more interest in the United States for its use in both of both of the these settings. I personally think that its role in diagnoses is not uh, it's not it certainly is should not be the standard approach before you have a diagnosis with an ultrasound guided biopsy. And there are a lot of reasons for that uh, based on the performance of the test. But there are some exceptions where uh, MRI can be can be helpful. And uh, those are the undergoing investigation. But for the most part, we can identify most cancers, at least most significant cancers, on biopsy done under ultrasound and don't need to go before the diagnosis of prostate cancer to the MRI. Where the MRI can be helpful, I think, is in patients where maybe that have had a biopsy and didn't show anything, the PSA keeps going up to an alarming level. It can, it can identify some cancers that we can't see very well because of where they're located in the prostate. Great, very helpful. And I think there's one more question we have about um, sort of biopsies. And Gary asked, if a biopsy finds a single low volume core that is a Gleason 8, is robotic surgery recommended? So say it again, it, it, one biopsy showed what? So a low volume core that uh -huh. is Gleason 8. Uh, well, it's very difficult without knowing the rest of the story to, sorry about that, um, uh, to, to, to know what the right treatment is. So it really comes back to uh, all the other factors that are important. Your age, your, your overall health, whether you have other health uh, uh, you know, conditions, diabetes, heart disease, whatever. What your what your personal beliefs are and your loved ones' beliefs are about the treatment of prostate cancer. You've got to weigh all those, and then you got to say, is my cancer the type of cancer that is going to change the my my expected uh, uh, when I'm going to die? Is it ever going to cause me problems? And as I showed you, whereas in general a Gleason eight, there's, it's high on the spectrum by the grade. So on the grade, it's more aggressive. But I showed you where the Polaris test uh, can take some Gleason eights and give them the actual risk, the oncologic risk, the chance of dying or developing metastasis or failing of your therapy, some Gleason 8s with a low Prolera score actually look more like Gleason 6s. And so if you're undecided, as, as, I suggest, as your question suggests, do you need treatment, that's the perfect setting for when, when you should have a Prolera's test. They will more precisely identify the actual risk of your cancer. Great. That's exactly what we're looking for. And I have a question from Alan who said, wants to know um, how soon the Polaris test will be available internationally. And once it's available internationally, what do you and do you have any idea of what the cost would be? Yeah, so Polaris is, is uh, available in most uh, sort of westernized countries throughout the world, either directly through Myriad, uh, the, through the inter international uh, branch of Myriad or through distributors. And if you go to Prolaris.com, P R O L A R I S dot com, it will it can uh, uh, it can uh, uh, show you where you can get it in what whatever country you're at. Uh, I'm actually not aware of what the current pricing is in different countries, so I couldn't answer that, but you could get that information through the website or through the to whoever you referred to from the website. Great. And 
more a little more about Prolaris. Um, Sarah wants to know if you've published any studies that suggest a uh, Prolaris high risk score patient does better when treated. Uh, well, we we haven't published a study that where we randomized. So we treated half the patients and and didn't treat half, the other half, and then saw how their Prolaris predicted. But we've we've published now. Um, uh, or yeah, so we've published uh, six studies in men that were treated either with radiation or with radical prostatectomy, and we can show who the chance of those treatments working. So we can tell you exactly your risk of failing failure of either external beam radiation or radical prostatectomy when you add Prolaris to your risk assessment. And in the radical prostatectomy, we, we've done it both on Prolaris done on the biopsy and Prolaris done on the radical prostatectomy. Great. And John just wants to confirm that for the Prolaris test to be done, you do need to have a biopsy specimen with, with a diagnosis of prostate cancer, correct? Great question, John. So you're, the answer to that is yes. Prolaris is done on the cancer that's that's found either on the biopsy or on the radical prostatectomy specimen. So we need to have cancer. We need a very small amount of cancer, but we actually have we have to have cancer to, to do the test. Great. And Fred had a question of how long does it take to get the results back usually after the biopsy? So 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 the way it is done and you don't do anything but when your physician orders the test, Myriad, our company, finds out where the biopsy or where the radical prostatectomy specimen is, and then we arrange to have that sent to Myriad, which is in Salt Lake City. Now, that can take a long time. That can take two weeks sometimes for the lab where the pathology is done to actually send the specimen to Myriad. Once it's sent to Myriad, your your physician will get a result in about a week. So so it takes about five working days uh, to to uh, process the specimen, analyze the RNA that we do, you know, generate the report, and then send back the report. Uh, but so the, the the Myriad part is is done in about a week. The the uh, we do have to get the 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 tissue, and I would say, kind of in general, we it takes about the average lab is, spends about maybe a week to get us the tissue. So the total process would be about two weeks. As you know, prostate cancer is a, a very slow-growing cancer, so waiting two weeks to get that result is not a big problem. You don't need to make your final treatment decision, in in my opinion. In, for you know, you can wait several months to make the uh, a decision that, that you're happy with, and you shouldn't be rushed into your treatment decision. So, the time for Prolaris uh, result it, it can be well within that range that you're you're okay to wait. Great, and we have a couple more questions, and next set of questions are about treatment and side effects. And one of is, is the person sterile after a prostate removal? Well, it's a great question. Depends on what you mean by sterile. The, the sperm is made in the testicle, and we don't get anywhere near the testicle uh, when we do a radical prostatectomy or, or radiation. So theoretically, you still have the ability to conceive a child, although not in the usual fashion, because you many men, most men will not ejaculate after a radical prostatectomy, even if their sexual function, their erections are normal. And also, you don't have the PSA that is uh, necessary, as I said, to change the semen to allow for a pregnancy. But you still have testicles, and so you can do with artificial insemination, you can extract sperm from the testicle itself. And so you can uh, conceive a child after this 
after this treatment. Now, if you've gone on to hormonal therapy or chemotherapy, uh, generally that will make the sperm not adequate to, to father a child. But other than that, you can actually conceive a child. Great. And so I, for our last question, we actually have several, had received several questions about side effects, and several of them uh, focusing on erectile dysfunction and incontinence and sort of you can just address how long it usually takes to recover from right. right after surgery and then what sort of tools are available or treatments are available. Sure. So let's let's start with incontinence. If you have, ra you said surgery, so I'm going to come at it. After radical prostatectomy, most men after radical prostatectomy, when, when you really ask them, will have some degree of urinary incontinence. And that primarily is exertional incontinence or stress incontinence when you when you cough or sneeze or grunt, you'll leak some urine. In most, the vast majority of patients, the degree of incontinence gets better over time. And outside of very conservative measures, you generally would want to wait about a year to allow continence to get back to its, you know, as good as it's going to get before you make a, a treatment decision to go on to, to do something about it. But there's still, at about a year, there's a, you know, depending on who you want to believe, 10 to 20 percent that may, that are significantly bothered by the degree of their urinary incontinence. And those patients, uh, you know, need to see a urologist to consider additional therapy. Similar to incontinence, erectile dysfunction gets better over time. Now, it's important to note that the nerves that that give rise to erections run right along the side of the prostate. And they can be injured either knowingly or sometimes because of a big prostate cancer, we, we actually surgically remove them, or we can injure them non-intentionally uh, during the operation. And depending on the degree of the injury, we can uh, 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 you, you can get some restoration of erectile function over time, okay? So just like uh, with incontinence, over time erections uh, tend to get better, particularly where, you've, where the surgeon has spared one or both of the, uh, the nerves. During the time when you're waiting for erections to, uh, to improve, most clinicians will will recommend that you undergo some form of so-called penile rehabilitation, usually with drugs like uh, Viagra, uh, to help you get erections, either when you want erections while you're awake or, or as you, most of you know, you get erections in your sleep. And this helps restore the, the function of the penis. Uh, it is, is widely used in patients that desire erections after radical prostatectomy. And to a certain extent, those co the comments I just made also apply in patients that have erectile uh, problems or urinary incontinence after uh, radiation therapy. Great. Well, I want to thank you again. And just uh, to let everybody know, I if we didn't get to your question, feel free to email us your question at info at zerocancer.org and I will work with Dr. Brower to see if we can get some of those answered. There weren't very many, but thank you. And again, I want to thank um, Myriad for their support of this program and most specifically Dr. Brower. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, my pleasure and good luck to all of you. Great. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.